Hi, everyone. So now we talk about next, day, uh, next steps for the S-Frame stack trace format. My name is Indu. I work at the Linux toolchain teams at Oracle. So we'll go over four things today. We'll go over four things today. The first is um, I thought it would be a good idea to just recap the format for you know just a few minutes. And so the first thing we look at, what is S-Frame format and where we are at when it comes to the support in the assembler and toolchain. And but for most of the most of the time today we'll be spending um, on more forward-looking things, uh, as in, um, so is there are there have been questions around how can we extend this to other ABIs? Should other ABIs be wanting to use S frame format? Can we do it? So we'll talk about some of those things. Um, recently, S390 showed up as an ABI interested in looking at S frame. Uh, then we move over, move on to talk about the current open items. And lastly, I think I do need some feedback on what other tooling or support is desirable when it comes to S-Frame-based uh, stack tracing. Um, so quick recap, S-Frame was first released in 2.40. That was version V1. We moved to version V2 in 2.41. So the, what we fixed from V1 to V2 was a problem which was basically unspecified alignment specification. So v, V1 said something about about unaligned accesses, but, so it said something about aligned accesses, but they were really unaligned. Anyway, we fixed it in the specification then in, two point, um, in V2. So we clearly say now that some part of the section is going to be aligned, but there is a blob of data which is expected to be unaligned. Um, so that's uh, V2. V1 is now considered obsolete, so there is no support in Benutils to go read or do object dump on V1, S frame V1. The current supported ABIs are AMD64 and AR64. So what is S frame? S frame is just minimal basic information that you need for stack traces. So given a PC, I want to find out what was the caller PC and so on until the end of the uh, call stack, uh, sorry, call frame. Um, it gives you only three basic pieces of information. Given a PC, what is the CFA, what is the FP, and what is the RA? Uh, CFA is the canonical frame address, FP and RA. Um, the key, um, I think one of the key uh, reasons why it supports this uh, use case of fast stack tracing is that the stack offsets are um, encoded directly. Um, and so speaking on the use cases, you uh, you could use uh, S-Frame for use cases when you want fast stack tracing without the need for preserving frame pointer. Also in the cases where EH frame-based stack tracing is not desirable. And I think, so this is all I have to say about S-Frame for now. If you are interested, these two are extremely good you know, uh, starting points. The first article does have more references in turn for you to follow and uh, find out more about S-Frame stack trace format. Mm, for the purpose of the talk today, I thought it might also be useful to go over a few basic, few more basic things. So S-Frame section is simple. It has an S-Frame header. There are some offsets that that help you land at the two different subsections, the S-Frame function descriptor entries and the S-Frame, um, okay, S-Frame frame row entry. So function descriptor entry keeps, um, just tells you basic information about the function itself. What is the start PC? What is the size of this uh, function? And the S-Frame frame row entries, the ones here in blue, are basically, um, this is the meat of the S-Frame uh, stack trace information in the sense that per PC, you want to find out what, where is the CFA, FP, and RA, and this is where the information lies in uh, S-Frame frame row entries. The FDE subsection here, um, so all those FDEs are clubbed together in this S-Frame uh, FDE subsection, as we call it. The, this section is sorted on the start PC, so this serves as a... You can do binary search to look up which FDE you need to land at, given a PC. Once you land at a uh, function descriptor entry, there are offsets for you to uh, basically then look at what is the exact PC where the uh, frame row entry lies. Um, I think that's it. So for much of the talk, we won't be getting more deep into the format, but these terminologies may come your way as I speak about S-Frame. So what have we done more recently in the last... Um, six months or so. The first thing is uh, is basically usability aspect of S-Frame. So 
GNU assembler at this time, if you pass a GS frame, it'll consume the CFI directives which have been emitted by the compiler. So it consumes some of those CFI directives and emits a S frame section. Earlier, at some point, we were just silently skipping some of those FDEs where we cannot generate S frame. But now there are explicit warnings and they are precise enough in the sense that if you're skipping something, I expect there to be a warning so that users, when they're compiling their applications, there is always a way for them to tell, okay, how much of it has been skipped. So on that, you'll see some warnings like skipping S frame FDE, non SPFP register in CF, CFI, define CFI. Basically, the first one um, will, you land at something like first one if there are specific patterns, say DRAP pattern on x86. I will talk about that um, later in the slides. The second one says, oh, there is a CFI escape. I will not deal with this, skipping. Again, there are some to-dos for me to do. Some of these CFI escapes I can implement and entertain in the assembler, but as of today, you will see these warnings, so for you to know that some S-frame FDEs are being skipped. The third one was added more recently because S390 wanted to see if we have this prototype working, what is it that we are missing anyway? So the third one is more like you won't run into the third one for AR64 and AMD64, only for S390. Um, but by and large, these warnings should be fairly limited. Uh, it's not expected that you will have a large portion of your applications where S-Frame is just not available. It does depend on the application, though. The DRAP pattern should not be frequent, but again, we'll talk about that uh, later on in the presentation. The second change that we did was around readability aspect of the specification itself. When S390 showed interest in... Um, S390 showed interest in S-Frame, we realized that we could do better in terms of the specification itself. So there will be interest, you know, hopefully from other ABIs as well. There should, it should be clearer in the specification what are the current provisions already made for newer ABIs to add support. So some, th some changes around those were done, so hopefully it's more readable and more... Um, you have clear indications of where to get started if you are one of those new ABIs who wants to have support in S-Frame. So that's it about, that's all I had to say about what the format is and where we are at when it comes to um, the support in the GNU assembler. If there are questions, I can take them around the content we talk or as we move to the next um, topic. Okay, so, uh, since the beginning, we, we did have it as a goal that let's at least try to support two ABIs, two arches, so that things are not too rigid, and hopefully, you know, as new ABIs come, it is easier for them to also add support, um, which was recently just put to test because S390 showed interest, and then um, these patches were posted by Gens. So the current status now of, uh, on this is that... Um, the patches have been discussed, some issues have been identified, and there is a resolution to many of those. But we will come back to these patches once it is clearer whether, whether and how the Linux side of user space stack tracing, uh, get, how it gets settled. Once, once we are clear that user space based stack tracing will be S-frame based, then there is more incentive for other people to follow and use S-frame. So, okay, so speaking of S390, it's the, it's the ELF ABI for the Z architecture. This 32-bit ABI has been skipped from this. I don't think there is interest in supporting that. So there were discussions on the mailing list, and I'll try to summarize those discussions by looking at the whole discussion from two, pers two main uh, perspectives. Uh, first being, um, what are the current mechanisms and what are the issues for S390? And then even if we do understand what the issues are, can S-Frame really do it? Because as we look more, we do see that S390 is quite a flexible ABI. S-Frame, on the other hand, does come in with its own, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, requirements that if you are using S-Frame for an ABI, please can you make sure that the RA is either on stack or a fixed register. And if you're using the floating point, uh, the frame pointer, Hmm. If you're using the frame pointer, please make sure that it's either on stack or um, fixed designated register. And the reason why S-Frame says that you need to fix a register is because otherwise you'll be tracking all of these registers across the frames 
And then you're talking about all these offsets being maintained for so many registers, it just bloats up the format. That's not, the form that's not what the format is intended to do. If, you're, if you are in the zone where you're thinking, I do need to track all these registers, I think EHFrame is a much better answer in those cases. Um, okay, so S390, um, what are the current ways of uh, stack tracing? First, of course, there is EHFrame, but in cases where EHFrame-based stack tracing is not uh, desirable or possible. There is, an, there is a provision in the ABI which says back chain slot. So this diagram here shows you um, stack layout in S390. Um, when the back chains are set up, the back tracing is as simple as, okay, previous SP will be the value at that uh, back chain slot. And once you know the previous SP, then you just recover the RA, which is your R14 from the register save area here. I don't have a mouse pointer otherwise, but I think it's easier to follow. Oh, no. This one? It's okay. Mm. It's just good to have. If not, I'll just carry on. <laughs> Works? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So basically, the ABI does say that um, there is there is going to be a, a back chain um, slot, and if you're using M back chain, the compiler will make sure that um, R14, which is the return register, and SP are saved at function entry. So sounds good, right? So and the Linux kernel is also compiled with M back chain, packed stack, and float. But M backchain does have issues. So I got this um, assembly. It's a simple, it's a function that's not doing too much. It's just going to call a function foo and then use, make a call to the use function and return. Um, so basically, the first instruction that you see is saying store multiple register STMG. It stores R14 and R15 into the register save area of the func uh, you know, for this uh, called function, which the caller has set up. So when you enter the function, R14 is available to you. It is the return register. If you so want to stack trace, you can use R14. Moving on, it says, OK, I need to save R14 to R15 to R14 for now, because I will be clobbering this register for my purposes. And then it goes on to uh, create a register save area for the called functions. And now at this point, you're saving the back chain, right? So, uh, so X is marking where the back chain is available. But in all of these instructions, there is no heuristic that you can follow to recover your, to just backtrace easily. So there are instructions, of course, where the back chain is set up. And once the back chain is set up, it is quite straightforward. It is very easy. But again, the problem remains that it, it is not uh, reliable. EH frame, of course, will work. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but now moving on, that was static allocation. In dynamic stack allocation, again, the ABI does make provisions, very clear provisions, that if you are doing dynamic stack allocation, make sure you save your stack pointer to the FP, and then you're good to go. But yeah, and the guarantees around back chain remain the same. So you enter the function, you did save you know, into the register save area for this function. And then you go on and um, do the same thing. I need to prepare for a called function. So you create another register save area. But soon, so R2 is an argument. In this function, n was an argument to um, you know, this function. So you, now the back chain is set up, fine. But now you realize I have to do a, a dynamic stack allocation. You go ahead, do the dynamic stack allocation. The ABI did say, if you're doing something like that, make sure frame pointer is set up. It is set up, so here, uh, until here, you're fine. You do have the back chain set up. But at some point, you are now sub clobbering R15. Back chain is messed up. And again, you set it up. So there are X marks where the back chain is set up. So there are points in the program where back chain is set up here. But for the other points, following the back chain from your star SP is not going to give you reliable results. You could do some heuristics around SP or FP. But again, the stack tracer won't know, should I follow SP or FP? So therein answers. So that so that answers our question of why um, backchain doesn't work for S390 and why is there a desire to look for other solutions. So summarizing, I talked about two things, like the topmost function, the 
back chain is not quite set up. It might still be in the you know, um, prologue conditions, uh, prologue instructions. In dynamic stack allocation, again, we saw the cases where uh, there are instructions. There is additional work where the back chain is just not set up. There are more finer cases where it's known that back chain does give you problems. So at least that question is settled that there is back chain, but there are solutions with it. Some of this was discussed recently in, um, in this thread where they were asking, should we just enable M back chain for the whole user space? So if there are issues, I think there is first, um, the, it makes sense to first go look for either the solution or a reasonable answer to how we can resolve this problem. So. Um, now we are getting into the second aspect. So there are issues with S390 and backchain, but can SFrame really help? Because as we see, S390 does turn to be does turn out to be a quite a flexible ABI. So I will talk about those issues now from you know from this point onwards. But the main summary is it looks doable, which is good. Um, there is going to be need for making some adjustments, not only in terms of the stack trace format itself, you do need to make some uh, you know, changes in the format so the new ABI is supported, but you will also need to um, have some specific flags in the compiler. You may need to still go to the need of even specifying in the ABI some clear rules around if you're using S-Frame, please follow these specifications. But again, much needs to be seen, and let's talk about them. Um, now, I think it's a good point, yeah. OK, so the first thing that was observed was that um, the ABI does not designate a single frame pointer register. Although GCC and LLVM, for most cases, do stick to R11, this becomes a problem for S-Frame because um, S-Frame doesn't want to go and track all of these registers, which can be potential FP. So if S390 has, I forget, maybe like, um, 20 registers or so, many of those registers could be used as FP. But that's something that does not go well with S-Frame. So what do we do? We don't want to track these registers in S-Frame. In so one potential resolution could be that you create a GCC option, ask the compiler to consistently use R11. And so there was a case which has been observed. I think we need to follow up more. There is a F stack protector where the compiler does go and use something other than R11. So there may be cases where R11 cannot be used. I think we need to go one by one uh, on a one by one basis. But so far, it seems like this possible resolution could work. You ask, uh, the, you implement a new option, MS frame, where the compiler consistently picks a register. So that should settle the problem of of um, FP being um, FP not being a single register. Same problem with RA. S-Frame says, um, if it is RA, please it, either be it on a specific register or it be on a stack, because that's all that S-Frame tracks. Um, S390, on the other hand, says, I am going to fix a register, but beyond the function entry, there is no guarantee. The return address could be in any register. Um, luckily, I still we still think that this option should serve the purpose. We ask the compiler to consistently use R14 as a return register. So the two problems look like they could be resolved. I don't have the mic. OK. You want this? Question on the next slide, and then I'll. Uh -huh. No, so my, is it working? I guess it's is it recording? I guess. Yes. Or, yeah. Okay. So my question simply is just: uh, Have you done performance checks on you know where? This is like adding a frame pointer. I know the whole problem, you know, the S frame was supposed to uh, solve was to be able to um, get stack traces without requiring frame pointers. So when you kind of put these requirements in, have you know, do you know if there's been any uh, noticeable uh, regression in performance by enabling this? Mm -hmm. So in this case, all we are saying is that if the compiler wants to use a frame pointer, it sticks to one register. 
So it's not saying that you should always preserve the frame pointer. This is different. It's saying that if you if you so need to res to preserve the frame pointer, so the cases you would need to go preserve frame pointer is if you're doing things with your stack pointer. So if you do dynamic stack allocation, you go preserve your stack pointer into a frame pointer. So the ABI is flexible there, and the problem is it says, okay, move. So equivalent in um, x86 terms, you'd say something like you're moving RSP to RBX, RAX, some caller saved register even, which becomes a problem for S frame. It's not really, um, S-Frame is not really asking um, that F-Frame pointer be maintained, no. It's just saying if frame pan pointer is maintained, it be one register. Um, yeah, this is not really a problem, just an observation. Not many, yeah, no, no one does silly stuff with, uh, well, you can't do silly stuff with the stack pointer here. So we are okay here. So CFA here says, um, Add entry uh, CFA will be SP plus 160, and whenever you do save uh, R15, it is at a fixed register into the uh, fixed slot in the register save area. Um, sorry, just about the uh, prior slide. I think the question was more uh, the reason the frame pointer isn't always in the same location might be because the register allocator finds that it wants to put it maybe in a register first, then at an area with register pressure spills it, and then maybe puts it back. So uh, the question was whether there's appreciable performance impact from that. Uh huh. I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to check that. I mean, once we implement the option, I think these trade-offs need to be checked. Yes. Okay. So the third one that was observed was save and registers. Uh, so. Recall how S-Frame says, if it is on register, it's fine. If it is on stack, I will track the offset for you. But in case of S390, they do have registers in which you can save, for example, in this specific function. Uh, it's an example of a leaf function where R11, which is the frame pointer, is saved into F0. Um, S-Frame does not like this because of the same reason that if you are saving now your frame pointer into these registers, it needs to be tracking these registers um, as well for stack tracing. So um, there is a resolution to this as well, and the silver lining is only because these are leaf functions. So the problem here is that leaf functions may be saving uh, FP into, uh, sorry, this frame pointer into some FP registers. So there uh, the solution here could be that because this is only leaf functions, you're not really asking the stack tracing format to track these. It might be enough to just encode it somehow that get this value from this register because this being the topmost um, frame, you will all, the stack tracer will always have access to these registers uh, from the context. So going back, how can this be done? So. Um, I think something that I missed covering now that I realize is um, so these S frame frame row entries, right? So all these offsets are basically hanging. So S frame frame row entries are variable length entries, and at the end of each entry here is a, is a variable length um, array of bytes, and it is up to the ABI to use those bytes for the purpose of stack tracing. So in case of AMD64, in case of AMD64, those bytes are interpreted as follows. The first offset is interpreted as CFA offset. So you take the base register, and using that offset, you find what the CFA is. The second offset is interpreted as uh, offset for FP. Similarly, the rules that are defined for the ABI in case of AR64 are as follows. Now, when it comes to S390, you are allowed to use that offset in a specific way in the sense that you could say the last bit I'm designating for a special purpose and the rest of the bits will actually encode the register number. Uh, it, it, it should work. Uh, the, the only thing here is that you do have to trust the information in stack trace format, which you will have to do anyway. We could some, put some guards in place as in when we are generating this information that this be reliable. But I think all of those things should fall into the category of um, doable. Again, remember that all of these patches were posted. We discussed um, you know, on the mailing list. Much of the story has to evolve. But the only good news here is that for many of the big problems that we were fearing earlier, well, there seems to be a resolution. 
Mm, the fourth one is save FP without RA. This turns out to be sort of an unfortunate accident. In the terms of this is a limitation in S-frame implementation, things did get, well, some things were rigidly written down or something. But the solution here would be to uh, fix the GNU assembler and some lib S-frame ABIs. Basically, the APIs assume that if the FP is being saved, um, the RA has already been saved. This is true for x86, because when you do the call instruction, RA is already on stack. And if you're saving the frame pointer, sure, FP goes on stack. In AMD64, again, this remains true. So it somehow just got leaked into you know the way code was written. But this should be fixable. OK, so that summarizes. I think there are more finer grain issues that have been seen, as in some specific code sequences in glibc need, may also need adapting because um, the register usage there doesn't really align to what S-Frame uh, wants to do. But the thinking there is still that let's take it one by one, and it should be resolvable in many cases. Um, that summarizes what I wanted to say about S390. So it looks like there is a way to support S390 in S-Frame. Again, these are very small little things, but the main take here is that there were these main of there were these issues that were identified, and with using this option like MS Frame, um, you could uh, and so at some point, if you are making changes like um, I add a compiler option of MS Frame and you're asking the compiler to pick a specific register, the thought did strike that it should be something that the ABI specifies, because if you want compatibility across tool chains, compilers, this is something that should go in the ABI. But I think things need to be discussed more, and we see how the discussion goes. An orthogonal thing that has been observed is, of course, it makes it goes a long way if when you are making your ABI considerations and S frame is a desirable candidate for stack tracing. I think it makes sense to do some uh, you know provisioning at that time and make sure that the ABI is um, is aligned for faster stack tracing. And even if without S frame, I think many of these considerations are good to make. Um, well, so. I am switching gears now, and I'll talk about the current open items, if there are questions around what we talked. Uh, so hmm. many offsets are available at free or maybe I, I think maybe you can, you can repeat the question. I can repeat the question. So many offsets are currently available for maybe a specific usage and um, architecture specific usage. So the information is encoded in the format in the sense you're, oh, yeah, question. Oof. Yeah, the question is how many offsets are reserved in the ABI for reserved in S frame for ABI specific purposes? The answer is there is no reservation there. You can go as high as you want or as low as you want. The recommendation, of course, is to not track too many registers, but you could add any number of offsets. Of course, this affects the size of the format and so on. But so in the FDEs. You're, so in the FDE, you encode how many FREs are following, and each FRE tells you how many offsets there are following. So it's flexible in the sense that you can encode as much as you want. But of course, there are some guidelines on why you should. Well, there are guidelines on what's the maximum you should go, because at some point, if you are tracking too many offsets, the S-frame information would be too bulky. So yeah. So we move on to talk about current open items. Um, some, of these may have, some of these do affect asynchronicity in the terms of how much coverage do you have with S-Frame. So we'll talk about what to do with signal frames. The second is the DRAP pattern on x86. I'm not too sure at this time whether this pattern also shows up in other arches. Um, and then we'll talk about, this is a known item. I, we need to just get to it at some point. And one of the main things I'm looking for is if there is any feedback on what other tooling or support will be desirable for S-frame-based stack tracing. So um, this, um, I saw this bug some time ago. I just haven't been able to uh, you know, follow up on this too much, but now is a good opportunity. So this bug said there is a problem with EH frame. Um, and it said, OK, if, if it is normal stack 
tracing. A stack unwinder, well, in this case, unwinder, the stack unwinder would do a minus one to know to just find out what function you are in. And in case this is a, this is because of a signal. So if the program received a signal, what is saved is the PC of the instruction that got the signal. So if it so happens that the PC or the first instruction that you are in a function, you receive a signal. So this will confuse the stack tracer heavily because then you are either going to a junk FDE or going to the previous FDE. So this same problem should also show up for S-Frame because we don't mark um, the signal trampolines as such. But that should be an easier problem to solve. Like you can make a provision in the format. There is already a CFI directive, which people should be using right for signal trampolines. But I think the bigger problem for us as S-Frame is that when I look at, so much of this in S-Frame can be ignored because we do not care for RCX or R9 recovery. We do care about CFA recovery. But this, um, um, how should you say, this um, style of recovering CFA is not quite, is not encodable in S-Frame. So here you're saying uh, RSP plus 60 and then dereference it from stack. S-Frame doesn't represent this information. S-Frame just can represent CFA and offset. I do know that in some cases, for example, some stack unwinders will just go recognize these instructions and just do the right thing. But I can also see that this can be painful because what do you do across architectures? Do you go on to recognize all these patterns? How do you resolve it? So my question here was, what is the pain factor associated with this? And then we can decide, well, resolving this in S-Frame will just need more thinking and being sure that this is represented well in S-Frame. But what I'm looking for is how painful is this to do it without S-Frame. Um, again, this is signal trampoline, so depends on the programs. It could be frequent. It's just, um, So if you have any inputs on this, I'll appreciate. But otherwise, um, the thinking here is to wait and see how much of a pain this is, and then we invest some time in getting this resolved. There are other trampolines, by the way, this is one trampoline, but there are other trampolines where you could look at it from both sides. Is it possible to write the trampoline such that it is encodable, it has encodable S-frame information? I think we can, there are cases where I'm seeing the trampoline could just uh, be written differently, but in this specific case, I don't think so. And um, that's where the question is, um, if this is a problem in reality, well, it should be, but how much and what should we do in S-Frame? Okay, so the second known issue with S-Frame is the DRAP pattern. Um, this has been seen to exist on x86. Uh, the, the cases where the compiler goes ahead, so the DRAP pattern is basically dynamically um, realigned pointer pattern. So you see when you entered, um, the function says, can you save this value at R10? And then it goes, aligns the stack, and then it pushes. So this is basically the return address. It aligns the stack pointer and then prepares the stack for this usage. So at this point, the stack pointer is aligned, and the RA is pushed to the correct value. But in, these, in this small stub here, um, S frame do not does not have uh, does not have information and basically in assembler the moment it sees CFI defines CFA R10 it says oh no I will skip the whole thing it does skip the whole function because S frame does not have holes either you have S frame for the whole function or you don't so we could resolve this somehow I think there are options for us to explore but I, my main um, question here was again the same from my perspective I have not seen this pattern too frequent. Uh, so on that, why would the compiler generate such a thing? If you have code base, which, which, for example, the input stack was four byte aligned, and what you do in this function, for example, as a C instructions or uh, some other types, you may want the stack to be 16 byte aligned, which is when the compiler will generate these DRAP patterns. So it's really on the application, but from what, uh, you know, from everything that we have talked so far, this pattern is restricted to few specific cases. Um, yeah, not the case? Example. Okay. Um, if you use YM or VM registers, yes. it, the, the, the compiler will do this without the program. Yes, doing it. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it seems even to us that the right thing here to do is just go ahead and support it because otherwise it remains always hanging and of the neck. And okay, so. In this case, I don't think you can use the frame pointer. Why? So it does set up the frame pointer here, but at this point, I think uh, the compiler cannot push anything on the stack. It really wants the stack pointer to be aligned, and then it starts using it. So if you use the frame pointer, I think the problem is that you will have to push the frame pointer on the stack. This is one of the questions I have. If yeah. So basically, in, in that sequence, there is a hole where s frame could not determine where to go back. Yeah. It's just that we didn't think it like that since the beginning. If there are holes, um, the unwinder will have to check more things. So at this time, once you land at an FDE, FDE is um, the function descriptor entry. Once you land at the FDE, you want to find out in this function, I have a, f um, I have a PC. So now if there are holes, you will have to go serially. You can, de correct, you could describe the hole too, you're right. But it's just that something that hasn't been um, thought of like that. It didn't seem necessary, so we didn't, but it it's possible, cool. it's possible, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. Is to just say hole, yeah. not yeah. describe what's in the box. No. Yeah, okay. say something undefined. So if you are yeah, stack tracing from that point, you say bailout, I don't know, S-Frame cannot do it for you. Sorry, repeat that. But Why do you want to describe the hole? It's another function. Mm -hmm. But you did not uh, have an SDE just for the hole. Yes, yes, yes. You could try some things around that. Yeah. I think there are options to explore here, yes. So we'll just go ahead and um, see which ones of these are working out best. Uh, it's possible that we could encode just one function which just acts as the whole for um, the cases that S-Frame cannot cover. Okay, um, yes. So the, just saying unsupported is problematic, I think, because those uh, 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 will this is experiment, we think there might be quite a few Right. Representing this in S frame won't take too much either because as we were saying this, if at all the stack tracer is here, this has to be the topmost function. So you can always encode that get the value from register. You don't have to track this register in S frame. For this pattern, for just this pattern. Yes. Yeah. Wait, in that entry sequence, where would you point S frame to take from? To take what value from register? Uh, uh, you would. After the end Q, you, 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 don't not, you know nothing about your original R2. No, you know about R10. So what this says is the CFA is R10. Yeah, and you entertain that until the point here where the stack pointer is set up. Oh. So it, the problem is only for these few instructions here. And you have a way to encode the R10? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We were thinking of encoding, but then the problem becomes, and on the assumption that this is the topmost function, but as it's been pointed out, okay. you do need okay. more there. Mm -hmm. And then the whole, there is no, not going to be a signal in the first few instructions of, of such a function. 
but yeah, if the single frame gives you this metric step as well, so that you don't have to track it across the entire length press. Yes. But uh, you still have to have the digital button to pull it from the single frame. Yes. Okay, and then S prime, the, the consumer of S prime needs to know how to decode the signal. Sorry? You can hide the signals down to the input alternative and then just get the bank to the signal. If we encode the signal trampoline in S frame, then it's doable. Right now, this is not being encoded. So both of these need to fall in place. So this definitely needs to fall in place if there is a signal. Once this is in place, uh, we do need to make sure, but the signal trampoline will save all registers. So we are okay there, or are we well, not? But on this hmm. slide, you said all the DS, uh, DW CFA expressions are of no interest. But if you no, DW CFA expressions are important. What these these expressions are not important. Where you are saving RCX, R9, or R8, because I assume in S frame that nothing of this is going to be of importance because all the tracking is CFA, FP, and RA. Yeah, Example, there was our yes, yes, we have a problem there, yes. If at all, and the problem with DRAP is that it's just not R10, it, the compiler does choose RCX. It has heuristics, it does limit it to some specific registers, but it's free to choose, there is no specification there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the thing here was what if you get a signal right on the first instruction or where you, when you are in this zone where you say that the CFAs are 10 based and you get a signal, then, then basically at this point our CFA was R10 based and then you go handle the signal and if you need to stack trace now from the signal handler going through the trampoline, you will not get the correct information because R10 saving and so on has not been represented in S frame. It's a very specific case, but it will not but work. You could represent this, as you described, this um, uh, signal trampoline as Sorry, just as then. To decode mm -hmm. this piece that is technically a library as a separate function and this first allocation mm -hmm. of the frame as a pattern library using the one offset like we did for the SP90. I think the, the problem is that you, that you don't want to propagate our pen across every Yes, so if you don't have a signal, it's fine, but when you do have a signal, there will be a problem. Yeah. To this, yes. I think it's still conceptually tough to use mm -hmm. the OGN frame for this. Mm -hmm. It's just the yeah, it's fish port. Because okay. uh, do you have for signal processing? Uh, I'll give you the mic. I think it's better. Now, for single processing, um, this is at least for like profilers from within the kernel. The kernel could actually know that you're um, 
is it the pro- problem that you just got interrupted at that point in the in the uh, process? I mean, how's that any different than if an interrupt went off there and you were doing? I mean, you could register for that, but if you if your um, instruction pointer happens to be at one of these locations, is that going to cause a problem for uh, yes, S frame? So it's the problem is that what's saved in the context as the as the PC to return to is the is the instruction itself, and if it is the first instruction. The unwinder is, or the stack tracer here, is always doing a minus one. So you land at a different FTE. Because, so, well, say for a profiler, this could happen. It's not a signal. It's at any time. I mean, profiling could interrupt at any instruction mm-hmm. whatsoever. So you're saying that in some instructions that you might not be able to get a uh, uh, stack trace because? It depends on the trampoline for that handler, I think. Well, I'm not talking about a single handler. There's no trampoline. Just when you basically, if you're interrupted, yeah. um, there's no trampoline. It's just the kernel will stop you at the location you're at. Yes. And then you get the instruction pointer for you're at right there. And you start there at that instruction pointer. Is that the problem? Like if you. So. Yeah, so basically, yeah, if, if I say, like, the interrupt happened right at that point, mm-hmm. and the instruction pointer's at that point, the S-frame information will not be able to say, this point here, this is where you get the register from, or get the, the frame pointer from, or, or the return address. I mean. The signal, oh. I think, was something else, and so you have a uh, trace, but suddenly it's kind of comes back. Yeah, it's not only the frame pointer that's affected. Every register it gets saved in different places in the signal handler. So I mean, I mean, this this location isn't saved in the uh, the table, the first table. I mean, for information, it's saying if you're in this. As of now, it's not important. So I think she said even all function points, the whole right now, it's actually less than one for chat. So this function, yes. Because this function. Oh. Yeah. So there's no way to describe where, how to find the caller of that. Well, the single handler won't play nice this anyway, so. Well, I'm not talking about single handlers. I'm talking about profilers. This is how the profiler is happening. It will interrupt the program at any location, any time. You can't stop it. The kernel has full control. Yeah, but it's the topmost frame, so it's, again, easier to solve for this one. That's what I'm saying is if it's, a, it's still the topmost frame, but the signal is no different then. The kernel would know that the signal happened, and the kernel could even find, probably find out, you know, oh, it's, we're in a signal, we could ignore. And the kernel might still have kind of an analogous problem to this user space signal handler, because um, when the kernel interrupts itself, there can be multiple stacks that can be interrupt. Um, there can be NMI. Yeah. So in each... Signal handler, which we call you know interrupt handler, whatever is saved in the stack will save the entire registers, and we with org we annotate where to find those registers. So it's a different type of entry. Dif- yep. Instead of FTE, it's like a, a signal description entry or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So I think the the problem with the subtraction of minus one for the very entry point of the function. Uh, uh, I think that is something that is uh, that is solvable because that is a heuristic. And the heuristic is typically right when you want to unwind the stack. But for the purpose of profiling, you simply don't want to do the subtraction in the common case. And there may be special cases where it is needed, like when you're on the return instruction or some other special situations. But in the common case, I think for the kernel's profiling purpose, you just don't want to start at RA minus one. Started RA. Yeah, that's what he had trying to anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, it's yeah. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, part of the problem is if the R if the if the RA points to the beginning of the function, um, we don't know whether that was a if there's a function right before it that had a uh, tail call. Exactly. Right? That is the one special situation. Yeah. Uh, the tail call is why this heuristic exists in the first place. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so it's only we use this tail call. Well, what we do is we subtract one. That's why she said they subtract one from the RA because to catch for those types of cases. The only case it doesn't work is 
the signal handler type case where the, the instruction pointer is not a call return address, it's, um, it's the address. The kernel will know that not to subtract. For the first, into the first time, you don't load subtract one, you use whatever the instruction number is. Yeah. But I'm saying it's in the signal handler, the kernel knows it's in the signal handler. So, so uh, there is actually uh, an, an important uh, thing here, and I think this may, uh, m may best be solved in the compiler. If the tail call is immediately followed by the entry point of the function and you get an, uh, the address at that point, you can't decide which of the two it is. B besides taking the, uh, the fact that you have the to top level. Well, when you have the top level of something, you know it can't be past the call because in that case, uh, the, the call would have executed already. No? So the, the minus one, as I recall in the unwinder, is there to make sure that if you backtrace, then from the, the purpose of the unwind regions, the call is, looks as nested inside the unwind region. And for S-Frame, that might not actually be, be that important because um, the the registers as they are tracked are lim more limited. So you don't have to... I mean, it, 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 what I'm trying to say is that the situation might be somewhat different. So the, the minus one is there because um, the return address the backtrace on the stack or what you have on the stack is not actually a backtrace where you come from, but it is showing where you're going to. Exactly. And to pretend, because the unwinder wants to know where things come from based on subtract the one, yeah. is a subtract the one and hopes that it gets nested into the previous region. Right. And uh, I don't know what uh, if that's necessary for S-Frame because it might be okay with the information where it's going to as a, a, a approximation. No, because it similarly wants to find the FDE for the function. So there really needs to be a distinction between top-level function or called function. In the top-level function, you don't want to subtract. In the called function, you want to subtract. So th this is extra information that you now need to pass into wh whatever is actually interpreting the S-frame. Okay, um, so for memory tagging, I think this is a small item rather. We do have support for pack instructions, but as new um, features have been added to the AR64, like specifically MTE, we do need to tag now the FDEs which are um, using MTE instructions. So that's something that should be put in. Um, now moving on to what other uh, tooling or support that what other desirable tooling or support is necessary for S-Frame? On one hand, we have the user space stack tracing in the Linux kernel, which is moving along. There is work in progress. Um, there is work also that is planned for, uh, for then exposing the user space stack tracing via perf. Um, on the toolchain side, there was an ask sometime that if we could add S-frame-based built-in stack tracer in GDB. Um, and there was, um, there was also interest by some folks in doing something like extending the Python library with uh, information about S-frame and then using a stack tracer using the Python GDB uh, hooks to create a new stack tracer. It makes sense if you are adding new ABIs. I think this sort of an infrastructure will be useful. Um, so where I'm getting at is that there is interest in coming from different areas and all of that is sort of um, converging uh, into asking can we have more S-frame based stack tracing in, um, in the tool chain. So a bit of history on that, we did have a small library that we wrote lib S-frame ST. Uh, we didn't upstream it. Initially, the plan was to post it in, um, you know, up, uh, host it in uh, bin utils, but then we realized over time that that doesn't seem to be the best place to put a library like this. Um, it still exists. We use it for internal testing. 
And at some point, a suggestion was made, why don't you look at lib backtrace and provide a new interface, for example, backtrace underscore s frame. But I think the more we look at lib backtrace, it's actually the wrapper APIs. And even for, uh, even for the current unwind needs, it does go to what GCC provides or CLang provides. So it does seem that even if we go lib backtrace route, the problem comes back to you asking, what do you want to do with the stack tracing library? Where should this be sitting? Um, Which one, sorry? l yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the proposed, I would say, needs for the stack. Yeah, yeah. And two of the consistent needs that the order to get. Uh, so that would be the main place. We already have a GCC. Um, I would say once l is being supported by BDD, I would be in a position where we could look at adopting it on our own in the interesting. I could make that argument then because it would be likely No. I think one benefit you get from using the libgc underscore as unwind API is that there's a hook for registering JIT code. And if you don't provide that, then there will be a definitely will be a regression. Um, and yeah, on, on the other hand, I would like to see, so there's backtrace the function and backtrace the function is actually implemented in glibc. And if uh, S-Frame is using an allocated, what's it called, allocated section that's available at runtime, if it uses that, then we could use that directly with nglibc. Hopefully the format is not too difficult to parse. So we can't link against uh, other libraries and we, we can't really deal open lib gcc underscore s, but that is not really the way of uh, doing these things, especially in crash handlers and stuff like that. So I would like to see this in glibc. Um, uh, and I would also like to see a way to handle JIT runtime generated code and have a format extensions in a much bigger discussion for that yes yeah it, yes. you don't need a new format for that necessarily you just need to have a convention for or yes. an api for registering additional yes you say okay here's my code area and please use that as frame data for that code area or something like yeah. that we had some initial discussions on that around what is it that s frame should provide around jit for support in jit environments one of the things that does come out is that whatever your stack trace section is, it needs to be growable in the sense you cannot be doing, if you're registering more functions, you cannot be doing uh, oh, copy over the data and then add more functions there. It is ideal if you sort of leave some space for some growth and then move over. So much like you would dynamically allocate, you, you do some allocation beforehand and then grow over time. It's more flexible. So which is why I was saying that maybe you do need format extensions just to support that use case a bit better. Uh, one thing you also could do if you need to dynamically grow a uh, stack, some, it might be possible, especially if it's mapped to memory somehow, is to create a duplicate copy. Like, so if you need to extend the size, you could actually create a big array, do a copy, and then just switch over to the new copy and then free the old one. This is like yes. basically RCU type. So the, yeah, yeah. What I was mentioning about growable is to just reduce those number of copies. So, right. yeah, so you have on, a yeah. large thing yes. and then just fill it up and then when you hit the max, then, then you do you the copy. copy. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, I think this can get pretty, uh, this could get large amounts of uh, copying S-frame information. So uh, JIT was mentioned and um, for kernel, that's a real, real concern because we do want to 
um, stack trace through JIT. Um, one thing that I would like to propose is we, we just have a standard for JIT that it always has uh, frame pointers. Mm. That way, if there's there's a gap there, we don't see any S frame entry for that. We can fall back to frame pointers. Yeah. Yeah. Matters about performance. Yeah, but it's, it's a lot easier than. You're just being lazy. I was saying, you're just being lazy. <laughs> so, you don't want to implement it. Um, so as far as LTT and GUSD is concerned, I would really like to be able to use that. There are some constraints, though. I mean, it, ideally, the licensing should allow to use it from a LGPL library. Uh, second, if possible. Um, secondly, if the tracer could be left uh, managing all the memory allocation, uh, and also if it can be async signal safe. So, I mean, I want to be able to call it from a tracer, from a signal handler, let the tracer handle all the memory allocation into its own sideband per thread data structure that it pre-allocates, and that would work. Uh, and I really just need to have this array of addresses, and then I, I do all the rest of the tracing on my own. Okay. Yes, I'm al almost close to summarizing. So I think we have uh, we have talked about a few things, and thank you for all the feedback. Uh, so as far as priorities go. Um, yeah, all of the items that I did talk about, the open items, I think all of those need some focus in the next few, you know, yeah, soon. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>